Hi everyone, it's my first English episode of my podcast. I'm with Roman Sadowski, he's the Canadian champion for the this year, so I'm very excited. That is my first English uh, <laughs> guest, so today we'll speak with him and uh, get to know him a little better. So first of all, uh, hi Roman. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I apologize. I can't speak French, so <laughs> otherwise I would have done this in French, but no. <laughs> There's no problem. It's making me practice my English, so it's perfect. <laughs> it's just good for that. Um, how are you doing uh, with the with the situation? Um, I mean, I'm good, but also a little bit bored. I'm sort of like hoping the next few weeks we'll start getting back on the ice. That's sort of the big hope right now, but everything is still completely a mystery. Yeah, because Ontario just called that, like, they reopened the rink and stuff like that, so. Yeah, there's a there's a little bit of, um, I guess, underlying meanings behind that. So they officially said that all individual sports can start opening up, um, but that didn't necessarily mean that clubs can open up. So basically what they're saying is your national sport organization or provincial sport organization, so it would be either Ski Ontario or let's say Skate Quebec, um, they would have to organize something or Skate Canada would have to organize something for you to skate. So clubs themselves can't open up. So we're still not skating. <laughs> so it's just a first step towards getting basically, back on this. Basically, it's, it's saying that it can open up, but basically it's all up to Skate Canada and Skate Ontario to decide how to do it and they have to do it in a safe way. So they have yeah. to, I guess, propose a protocol or some method of opening up slowly. Of course. And yeah. how, how are you doing with like staying at home and uh, being away uh, from Sur skating? Surprisingly not terrible. I didn't think, like if you told me March, because we stopped March 13th. I remember that very clearly because it was Friday the 13th and they said, <laughs> that's it, we're closing everything. And if you told me then that we'd be closed until June, I would be like, oh my God, like that's so long. But They sort of told us, okay, we'll be close till the end of April. And then they said, okay, to the end of May. And sort of the time kind of went by on its own. Um, I kept myself as busy as I could. And so far, it's, it seems, it's like long and not long at the same time. It's really weird. It's, it may get long because like we don't know when it will stop. So it's just, yeah, we just wait. Yeah. See, my, my rink, they said um, end of May. Well, initially it said April. Then they said end of May. And uh, I know some of the other rinks um, in Oakville, so that's where Kirsten and Mike skate. They said that they're going to be till the end of June. And some other rinks are also saying end of June. So right now, it might happen that they just might say that my rink's still to the end of June. So it's just a waiting game of like waiting what's Basically. going to happen. And then they, they just keep giving us updates, but they just keep pushing it more and more and yeah. more. Yeah, it's so uh, the unknown for everybody, I mean, so... Yeah, dealing with that is uh, it can be difficult sometimes. And uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and uh, how how uh, do you stay in shape uh, while uh, staying at home? Um, well, I try my best. Nothing's gonna completely be like exactly the same, no matter what. But um, I'm doing a lot of cardio off the ice, and I hate it. I hate it so <laughs> much. But I'm doing as much cardio as I can. I'm keeping up with strengthening workouts. And um, my coach, Tracy, she, uh, she set up some classes that I can do online. So what I mean by that is I'm literally teaching the class, but by teaching, I'm actually doing it. So it yeah. forces me to do, for example, a core workout with some of the skaters at my club that I teach sometimes. So it forces oh, me nice. to do it with them. Otherwise, if it's just by myself, I might not be 100% into it but now I have motivation because I have to look good in front of my students. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great responsibility. She gives you like, yeah, the, the good <laughs> trust. Uh, she trusts you. Do you do a good job? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about your uh, season. because you had a great season. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank we, you. We can call it like a breakthrough season. I think you call I it. I would say so. Yeah. A little bit. I don't, I don't know if it's the right word, but uh, um. Yeah, so this year you won your first Grand Prix medal and you won uh, Nationals, of course. Yeah. Um, what made a big difference this year? Like, what made that year so special that you could uh, deliver those performances? I think it was, I think it actually came from the year before. So 
last year I was already feeling a lot better about myself. Um, I definitely grew a lot physically when I was in that 14, 15, 16 age. And I had a, a long time to sort of adjust to that new body, um, adjust to getting quads, adjust to getting that triple axle really consistent. And so last season, I did really well in my first international, which was Autumn Classic. Um, so that was really good. But then my other competitions weren't quite as good. So I would say that the experience of last year, so I had Autumn Classic, which was good. And then I had some other competitions that were not so good. And Nationals last year, um, I'd say a couple of weeks into training were really good, but it just wasn't long enough for it to show at Nationals. So last year, I was really hoping that I could um, show what I can do on the ice because I had those two or three weeks that were really, really good. But it just, I think, based on results, it just wasn't enough. So then last year, my season ended short, but I still had that whole season of experience starting from Autumn Classic. So I sort of just took that, kept the programs, continued building on what I had, and then just sort of went from there. And then the season just slowly progressed from there. I would say we didn't start fantastic, but it started to build up and then I got the medal at NHK. So that was, that was probably my biggest breakthrough of the season. So I'd say that long program was probably the best one I did ever, at least of Schindler's list. No, I'd yeah. say ever, honestly, yeah. just with full content in general and everything was almost perfectly clean. I didn't have full content. The last jump I did double toe instead of triple toe because I just was too tired. But anyway, um but it was still like a great performance like yes, overall yeah yeah it was just the, the combo i did a double toe i did triple s double toe instead of triple s triple toe but it was the performance that i i wanted to show that i could do in practice that i can do in competition and so after nhk that was a huge confidence booster and then i had i think it was some something like six weeks until nationals so that's yeah. almost like a full summer training before your first competition of the summer yeah so then i just I went back from NHK, built on that. There's no point doing challenge because if I did challenge, it'd be literally like one week back and go challenge. So I skipped challenge, took those six weeks, built on whatever I had at NHK and just continued. And compared to the year before, I had two or three weeks of good training. This one I had all six weeks. It was like really, really good. And then so that you, I think you had more showed time. up. I had more time and I was more prepared in that more time. Yeah. Yeah. And also uh, you said you, you grew a lot. So uh mm -hmm. that that must be so difficult to adapt like we see so many skaters that when they their body changes they are not able to adapt to that new body but mm -hmm. you were able to do that but not only that you also uh improve your jump you develop uh, more skills and more mm -hmm. more jumps and stuff so how did you manage to to adapt to that body and like that eye difference you have from five years ago <laughs> yeah, I went from being one of the shortest in the category to probably one of the tallest. I think Nick Nadeau is pretty, I think we're almost the same height. I might, I maybe we're like neck and neck. I think it probably depends on the day who's taller. But Yeah, because I remember uh, like my first national uh, in novice and you were there and uh, you were really small. And then now, if you, if we get this year, you're like so much taller than me. So it's yeah <laughs> a crazy eye difference, like uh, from when you were younger. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's not something that I would feel right away. It wasn't like I woke up one day, I'm like, whoa, I'm six of feet. Course. It was it was more like um, uh, just sort of like slow. I felt my development slowed down, and then there'd be times where I realized, wow, like I was kind of more consistent a year ago as opposed to now so i say i got up to triple lots when i was 13 so that was my first junior uh, grand prix year had a very good junior grand prix season um i got bronze my first one the second one i took like eighth or something something along those lines eighth or tenth but um in, the, in that junior grand prix season i was with people that we know today that were very good so it was shoma there and yeah Uh, Han Yan was there. <laughs> so we were all in that, in that junior level. So they were very good. Um, so I was sort of chasing that, that sort of group. Then the following year, um, 14 years old, for some reason, my second junior grand prix season wasn't very good. And I'm not going to say it's because I grew because I, I didn't yet. 14, I still haven't. Um, 15, I landed 
think was 15. Mm. Yeah, it would have been 15 years old. I landed my triple axel for the first time. And then that would, it lasted for a total of two or three weeks. And then I would, I did not see that triple axel for another year and a half. <laughs> yeah. It was around that point that I started to grow. And when I looked back, say I was 15 years old and I was, reflecting on how many clean programs I did up to triple lots when I was 13 or 14. It was quite consistent. I was, I was, I'll, I'll say when I was 13, 14, every day I was almost going maybe one mistake and maybe not at all for like a whole week. And then 14, 15 years old, I was like starting to make one or two mistakes and just g general day-to-day -day training was more difficult and just jumps in general weren't as consistent. And then development wasn't the same, right? Cause I went up, to 13 years old, I was learning, okay, triple sow, okay, triple toe, okay, triple loop. And we were sort of just going really quick through the jumps. And then all of a sudden, stop. It came like all natural. And then yeah. suddenly you had to like think about everything and mm -hmm. like analyze more maybe with like every part of the jump because yeah. it, it was not feeling the same. Yeah. And so I was definitely um, discouraged because a younger me was learning faster and learning better than the older me. But I think it was good that I had um, a good team around me. So my coach, Tracy Wayman, she was Canadian champion when she was 12 years old. Yeah. And then she sort of disappeared until she was like 18. And then she won her Canadian championships again when she was 18. So she has sort of, sort of that kind of experience from being really young and then sort of struggling and then coming back up again. So I think having her to help me out Cause I, like I'd have times where I'm on the ice and I'm just in complete tears because I'm not, I feel like I'm not doing anything productive. So when I was 15 and lost my triple axel and even all the other jumps were kind of iffy here and there. And if you look at my results back when I was 15, 16, 17, I had really good competitions and then really bad competitions. And it was just like that all the time. You can see if you graph everything, my points, they were going up and down like this. Yeah. So you it was have to not a, a it was not a build up like that. Like it was, it you was could like, have a great. There was jump. a slight build up, but it was like very up and down build up. A lot right? of so variation. Like, yeah. So it basically, I, I focused on those really good performances and those uh, those small accomplishments here and there that sort of helped me to keep going because I figured, okay, I did it once, I can do it again. Let's just try to do it more often. And so having having the team um, surrounding me that could remind me of that was important and it was basically just time at the end of the day i had to be patient and just get used to doing what i had to be doing i'd say around 18 i stopped growing and that's finally where i could like okay oh. uh, start trying things so yeah so and you talk about tracy she's been your coach for such a long time so mm -hmm. she, it, it's good that you have such a nice like uh, relationship together that she can help you get through those moments and help you like see the the positive aspect of like your training and like your competition yeah. and stuff yeah for sure and so because we've been together for so long she knows my personality she sort of knows what works what doesn't and um just focuses on whatever needs to be done to help me out in that moment absolutely and i guess like she must have known right away example you get to the rink one day and you're not feeling so good i your, mm -hmm. your relationship must be at that point that you know each other so well that she can help you right away with exactly what you need. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then this year, so you won national. Um, it's a, of course, a big statement. Uh, were you coming in this competition thinking you could actually win the competition or you were hoping more like a medal or? Um, okay, well, that's funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I tend to be a very hopeful kind of competitor. So always when I go in, I focus, okay, focus on yourself, do what you need to, just do your best. But this one, I really was kind of thinking like, like it's kind of time. I don't know. The full six weeks training, I felt like this was it. Like I could totally do it. And I was sort of thinking the same thing last year because going with the training that I had last year, going into it, I was thinking, you know what, there's, there's a possibility, but it just didn't show up in the performance. So last year, I think after the short, I was maybe I'd say seven points behind first after the short. So it was actually very similar to this year. What I did was I, I popped one jump in my short. If I just rotated that jump, literally anything would have been better. I did, uh, I did quad south triple toe. I did triple axel. I think I did a single toe, which I never do single toe. Usually yeah. I do a double toe or something, but anyway. 
that that alone set me back seven points after the short, but seven points in the senior men is, is like nothing really. You mess up one jump, seven points is gone. So yeah, absolutely, it can change the ranking. I mean, in the short, it you you cannot just uh, focus on the ranking of the short. You can come back in the long. Like, yeah, for there's sure. There's so much point you can get. Yeah, and, and in the long, when now nowadays everyone's doing two to like five quads per program. If you mess up even one, that's already seven points more or less gone. So last year I was already thinking about doing it, but it just, I do feel I just didn't have quite enough time training wise. My body wasn't absolutely there. There was a chance it could have happened. It just didn't because it just, the, the chances were lower purely because of training. And then, so this year I had more experience. I sort of had a goal. I remember going into my first practice feeling actually, no, uh, Skate Ontario organized a practice at the actual Nationals rink, I'd say two weeks before Nationals. And if I remember stepping on that ice during that practice, of course, it's not set up. It like, still looks like a hockey rink and there's still yeah. glass and everything. But I remember stepping on there and feeling like really good. Like, I was training really well. The jumps there were really well. I'm feeling like this, this could be the place that I could do it. Then come two weeks later, I stepped on the ice and practices were going very well. And something about it, just I just felt like I could do it. And I know all the attention was going towards Nam and Keegan, and I completely understand it because Nam is, I think, two-time senior Canadian champion now. Yeah. Um, Keegan's gone to, I don't even know how many world championships. He's gone to Olympics. So the attention is sort of there all the time. But regardless, I just wanted to sort of show that um, I'm still a contender against those two. You know and what I mean? Cause, of course. Yeah. And you, you, were, uh, you were a contender, but... Uh, you just talked about uh, Nam and Keegan, and uh, the focus was more on them. Uh, did you feel that released some pressure off of your shoulder, like having the attention on the others a bit more going into the competition? You know, it's funny. I think um, pressure for me is mostly something that's um, self-inflicted, like it's something I put on myself. So yeah. most of the pressure I feel is self-pressure. So I think actually the attention on Nam and Keegan like that started since the beginning of the season. So at the beginning of the season, we have a um, high performance camp where the whole yeah. national team comes together. And so there's a lot of media stuff there. And even there, you can notice that all the attention is on Nam and Keegan and all the questions are going towards Nam and Keegan. They're like, oh, there's only one spot for Worlds. How would it feel to go to Worlds? And uh, I felt that I wasn't getting nearly as much. And that sort of was almost not really a pressure release because like I said most of the pressure I have is put on myself I'd say it was actually more of a drive because it was like oh I want to be there like why don't you ask me these questions you know yeah so even a high performance camp I was trying to um, I guess in those practices even try harder and after that experience try harder and work harder but in terms of pressure I'd say everything was um, from myself because even then like after high performance camp my thought process was like, I want to be there. And then the pressure's put on myself indirectly right away like that, right? So. You, yeah, you said to yourself, like you set your own goals and your own like, uh, like thought uh, of what you want to do in your skating. So right. it's, it's then that you create your own like uh, expectation about yourself. If yeah, that makes sometimes sense. Sometimes they're way too high too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about uh, also your... Uh, your music, because you're also like, a ve you're a very strong technical skater, but you're also a very artistic skater, which is, mm -hmm. I think, very rare that we see, because now uh, we focus out on the jumps, on the quads, and uh, mm. getting that technical content really, really difficult. But you manage to get that content, uh, like the jumps, but you also keep all your artistic side very strong all the time. So um, what do you think helps you getting that balance in your skating what do you mean exactly? like like the balance between having a strong technical uh, side and also keeping the artistic very strong so how do i find that balance yeah um well my coaches both uh tracy and gregor they're both um very focused on that sort of balance so they don't really like having a skater that goes too far one way, too far the other. So if the jumps are lacking, they're going to focus on jumps. If the um, art artistry is lacking, they're going to push for that also. Anytime I do a program, there's no way, like, 
Tracy will let me slack off on their performance. So I can be missing all the jumps, but if I'm not performing, she's actually more upset. Right? She's, she's not really upset if I'm doing um, like a training day and I'm missing jumps. I could do a program and fall on every jump. As long as I'm keeping the performance up, she doesn't care because in the end of the day, jumps are sort of, um, they're a training process. Yeah. So some days are going to be good. Some days they're not. And to focus day to day on jumps, like they will come, but stuff like artistry is, is very, it's not really day to day. It's just repetition. And, um, I feel that the improvement on artistry is very small, very, um, I guess minimal, but it's those small little differences that make a big difference. So something like a leg extension or an arm extension or where you look or, um, just how the body moves, how, how far your neck goes to the left or right. Even those small accents here and there, um, all those accents that were, I guess, suggested by my choreographers, all those little focuses, everything there is what helped bring out the artistry in my programs. And I think honestly, it's because of my team that's constantly reminding me of what they need to yeah. be. That's sort of why they came out and the focus on jumps is always there, but it's never at the expense of the artistry. You don't, uh, you don't like uh, sacrifice the, the artistic content just to uh, learn some jumps. Yeah, basically. And so it's almost, honestly, it's almost the focus is on artistry first as opposed to jumps because the jumps will come. Of course, I'm still trying. It's not like I'm doing artistry and then just like skating yeah. through a jump. I'm still trying the jump, but it makes it completely different when you do artistry 100% all the time and then try to jump because it is exhausting both physically and emotionally when you try to invest yourself into a program as opposed to just, see, I see the difference of skating in the music as, a spo as opposed to skating with music, right? It's not just you skating yeah. and music playing. You have to be in the music and being in the music is a different experience and it's a different kind of fatigue level as opposed to just skating, 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 jump, skating, 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 jump. So I guess they really reinforced on skate with the music all the time. So be in it all the time so that you can get used to jumping in that way. Absolutely. And you said like, um, that it was, uh, like you can get exhausted from the jump, but also from the artistic, like emotionally and stuff. And you, you have sometimes like uh, your free program this year was uh, Schindler's List. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, very dramatic music and a uh, very uh, dramatic story of, sco of course. Um, how do you, you get to choose those music and how do you get yourself like in the character of the performance to, to be able to like express those emotion mm -hmm. and those stories? Well, the, the piece in his list, like when it comes for me to choose music, it doesn't, sometimes it is me who creates a suggestion. Sometimes it's Tracy. Sometimes it's uh, whatever choreographer I'm working with. Sometimes, um, so my main choreographers that I've worked with the most would be Mark Pillay. He's in Vancouver, yeah. I think. <laughs> and then uh, David Wilson, he's here in Toronto. Sometimes they'll share music and they'll actually say, oh, I don't use this for short or whatever. So this time, um, I had no input whatsoever. I was sort of unsure about what I wanted to skate to. I had some ideas, but wasn't very set on anything. And so Mark just sent me this music. I listened to it once and I'm like, yep, yeah, it's good. We're good. Done. And the reason why I liked it so much was because you see Schindler's List kind of often, but it was very different. It wasn't yeah. the classic Schindler's List from uh, the film. And it was mixed in with Bells of Moscow, which is another piece that I really, really liked. And so they were put together in such a like different way. And I was thinking, okay, I can... I can do this in a different way also. So once we got the music together, um, Mark came in, we got it done. Um, once you get the music, I feel like when, when it's really fresh, you can't be, I guess, 100% invested emotionally in it. Yeah, because so it's so after, new. Right, so it's so fresh. You're thinking about, oh, where, where's this arm going? Where's, where's the head going? And so after getting the program we worked it so much without jumps for let's say a month or two to the point where it becomes like second nature it's almost like breathing as you're doing the whole program and it was at that point where you can start thinking about um the story and so i also work with my ballet teacher off the ice and we sort of go through the programs off the ice 
um, then sometimes work on the ice. And we sort of collaborate and sort of think of um, certain movements, like um, I can't really think of the top of my head, but say the arms go up or try to relate that movement to a specific emotion or um, for example, can't think of anything. Okay, let's say my arm is reaching somewhere, right? So the whole idea is look through your hand and like try to imagine maybe it's a family member you're fighting for or if it's um, something like that. So any, any movement needs to be connected to some way. Or if like there's a, there's a part in the beginning of my program where I'm looking at both hands and it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a dark image, but they say like, oh, imagine like your hands are like really, um, like really rough and like really tough and yeah. uh, as if you're experiencing whatever uh, people have experienced in those times, right? So we sort of try to create these images and these almost s small stories within the program that, um, that I can play through. And he said something, I, I can't find the exact words in my head right now, but he said that if you believe it, then the audience will believe it. So the whole idea yeah. was I need to convince myself that I'm in the story. And if I'm convinced, then everyone else will be convinced. If I'm not convinced, no one's gonna care. So that was sort of the, the work we did and we tried our best to sort of, I guess, find these stories, these little images that I can put in my head and then convince myself that I'm there and then everyone else is convinced. And it's about like creating like moments on the eyes that like pictures or that like we can relate to or we can like, that's, exactly. how, the, that's how the people connect because like they, they can see it through your program what you're trying to express. So. Good. Yeah, that's the goal. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> and uh, um, what is like you you can do like a very uh, dramatic uh, pieces, but est que, uh, well, that's a French word. Uh, do you like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would you uh, like sometimes to try some uh, also more like other style, like uh, maybe some more f uh, funny or like a light style or I don't know, rhythmic? Yeah, or... you know it's interesting that you say that. Um... Yeah, I, I do sometimes feel like experimenting, but I feel like that's something I need to experiment more so with a, a show program. Yeah, you know I mean, so Absolutely. show programs are definitely a, a safer a safer way to go. And I actually was planning to experiment a little bit here and there. We never actually came to a conclusion, but I was going to experiment maybe with a a quite different style with a, a show program this year. But I never ended up getting that choreographed and yeah. the time. Yeah. That's when everything started closing off. I'm like, okay, well, I don't it think was, it's it worth was it. not meant to be. So <laughs> no, and I don't think it's worth investing in a, in a show program right now or even trying to make one myself. So, um, definitely I, I do feel like experimenting with different styles and I have had a few different styles, but I would say they were in a certain, um, they were in all in a certain kind of movement bubble if that yeah. makes any sense. So yeah. there's a certain movement vocabulary that my style has. And even though every music piece is different and can be different. So I've skated to like a blues or uh, my short program last year was like a, a love ballad. I've skated to like a waltz. They all, they're, they're all different, but they still had a certain, I guess, movement vocabulary. Yeah. I might go into something different. I'm not going to say what that is exactly, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I definitely take experiment a little bit both on and off the ice to try and develop a different kind of um, movement vocabulary. And it's not that I'm trying to change something, right? Because people know me for a certain kind of style, but if I can sort of bring little things here and there that could help out, I think that'd be really good. But it's also uh, finding a, a piece of music that makes you feel good too. So. Right even if you want to experiment, if you're not feeling comfortable with the music choice, it's like, it's not worth it. I mean, yeah, hundred percent. I, I, um, the thing is I'll never skate to anything that I don't like because people often ask me like, Oh, what is your favorite program? And I can never really answer that because for me, I invest so much time and effort into every program that every program has a, a special place for me. So I tell people whatever I'm performing for you guys in that moment, that's my favorite program. It can be a show program. It can be a short program. It can be a long program of any year. It doesn't really matter. I'm in, I'm on the ice, whatever I'm skating there. And then that's my favorite program. And that's mainly because whatever program I chose, I loved it from the, from the beginning. Right. I never agreed to do, okay, fine. I'll do that. No, yeah. it had to be something that I, I, I absolutely loved. 
It's like if if someone asks you, uh, "Who's your favorite child?" Like, yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like that. It's like uh, I don't really know. But, yeah, you cannot you tell. so much, and they are sort of a, your children in a way. So you know, <laughs> I can't really answer. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk uh, about uh, your YouTube channel because uh, sure. you started that two years ago, I think, maybe. Around... I think so, give or take. Yeah. And um, I mean, you post videos about like your skating. Uh, uh, question answers uh, some yeah. stories uh, and also recently you put a, a short film that mm -hmm. was really great by the way thank um, you um what is what inspired you to start that channel okay well um i'd say a long time ago i had a sort of a, a passion for anything technology related so that can be computers that can be um video games and that sort of eventually went its way into like cameras and that sort of thing. Uh, when I was a kid, I really loved uh, Transformers. The movie came out. I loved the toy. I'm sure you're aware of Transformers. Yeah. And when I watched it, I thought it was the best movie ever. <laughs> but when I watch it now, I realize, okay, there's better stuff out there. But anyway, <laughs> at the time, I thought it was the best thing ever. And so I have all the toys. I still have them somewhere. On display but anyway i had them all and um do you know what stop motion is uh yeah like we with uh, pictures yes so i took a camera that I, an old camera that i had i actually still have it somewhere just out of like um like sentimental value but anyway so i, I would take picture by picture of my transformers either driving and then transforming into their yeah <laughs> robot form i i don't know why <laughs> for me that seemed like an excellent idea And so I was just doing that for fun. I would say maybe I was like, let's say nine, 10 years old, something like that. And at that point, I was, I was, I guess, putting the pictures together on my computer and I was thinking, oh, I want this to be better quality. Okay, so I, I, kind wow. of went, to my, I went to my dad and I convinced <laughs> him, I'm like, listen, can you get like a camera for the family? Because like I, I think a lot of families, they have their own family camera, right? So I said, let's get a Absolutely. better camera for the family so we can take pictures. And my dad's like, yeah, sure. So I convinced him to get a certain camera because when you're 10 years old, you're not going to spend a thousand dollars on the camera, right? <laughs> of so, course. So I got my dad to do it. And, in the end of the, and at the end of the day, he got the camera and then I was the one who was using it all the time. So I sort of continued with that thing. And then slowly over time, that sort of stop motion thing disappeared. I wasn't so much into Transformers anymore, but so that, that camera didn't really get much attention for a while. And then I'd say, come around grade eight. How old are you in grade eight? 12? Uh, in Quebec, we don't have grade eight. So I don't know what, uh, okay. <laughs> what is up. <laughs> let's, say, let's say 12 years old. I think, no, actually been 13. Because grade eight, I was in my first junior grand prix year. So let's say 13. That was sort of slowly coming back. And uh, I'd, I'd bring my camera, sometimes at events and take pictures. Yeah. Um, So sort of coming back and I did a few uh, uh, videos. So, you know, you know, when you're in elementary school and you do like a, a news report, like project, right? Yeah. And so one of them was, okay, do it on camera. I'm like, let's do this. I did like a green screen. So what I did was I took a green blanket. And so I experimented with that. So then that sort of passion came back. I was like, oh, let's do some video stuff. Let's do this. And it was all from that original camera that I wanted to do stop motion on. So that was kind of funny. And so I did sort of video projects here and there. Um, I did some video projects uh, in high school. So I took communication technology as a course in my high school. I wouldn't, I honestly wouldn't say I learned that much <laughs> in the actual <laughs> course. I think I learned more on YouTube than I did in the course. But anyway, I still did some um, experimentation here and there. And then I sort of came across this YouTuber. I don't know if you know him, but his name is uh, Casey Neistat. And so he was a vlogger in New York. And I'd say he's sort of known to, I guess, bring that whole vlog genre forward. Yeah. Because then a lot of people sort of took a lot of his style and sort of used it in a way. And I think that he was sort of that original person that really documented his own life. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And so I sort of kept watching him And at the same time, I was reconnecting with that camera. I bring it more to competitions again. And then I think after, I think this was 2017 season, my 2017 season finished. And so I brought my camera. I think it was Junior Worlds in Taipei. I brought my camera there. I enjoyed using it there. 
And I thought to myself, okay, I want a better camera because this camera is already like six years old. So yeah. now I can afford to upgrade. And I was thinking if I upgrade, I should also get something that's like video related because maybe I want to, I was already thinking like, let's, let's start a YouTube channel. So I was thinking about starting a YouTube channel in like 2017, April. I was already thinking about it. I think so it took me like, it it's, going, a, we're gonna it's, a, it's something that's been like in the back of your head for a long time. Like, yes. Yes. So I was thinking like, Oh, how can I fuse like two things that I love skating and, and these uh, cameras and stuff. And I was looking at these vloggers. I'm like, I could totally do this. So April of 2017, I was shopping for cameras for a long time. So it took me a long time to decide on what I wanted and what would work best for me. I honestly, now that I think about it, it was a good purchase what I made, but I, if I did it again, I would have done something different. But that's sort of something you, you have to learn the experience. Hard to of explain. But and there's so, so many choices. Like yeah, it, no. it's, it's hard to pick like just one. And <laughs> yeah, at the end go. of the day, honestly, you could do a YouTube channel with a phone, right? Anyone can do one. It was just, I had the specific idea. I want to do it like this. So yeah. I had to invest a little bit. And I got my camera, I think in May. I didn't start my YouTube channel until November of 2017. I think it's 2017. Yeah. And that was partially because I was kind of nervous. I was actually like really nervous. Like, is it going to be good enough? Or what are people going to say? And that's the thing with social media. Sometimes you get a little bit like, like shy in a way. That was yeah. sort of how I felt. And because you, ex you expose yourself like to, yeah, to everyone. It's, it's so. also different than Instagram. It's not just a picture. It's literally a full video. And I was like yeah. thinking, oh, are they, are they going to be okay with my personality? And now that I look back at my earlier videos, that wasn't completely real. Like it wasn't the real me because I, I could tell I was a little bit uncomfortable still because talking in front of a camera to yourself is a weird experience. I'll tell yeah, you when you're at absolutely. Home, you put a camera on, you start talking, you're like, it's different. But I, I'd say now, like I'm pretty well, like it feels like another person when I'm talking to the camera, I feel like I'm talking to another person. That was also, also something that I had to develop. You, you know, you know also that like people are watching, which like mm -hmm. at the beginning, maybe you were like uh, a bit nervous about like, are people going to like it or not now? Like, yeah, you know, people follows you. So you feel exactly. more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little bit. So it took me a long time to, so I, like, to like actually start it. And then once I started it, I just sort of went with it and just kept going and just sort of had fun with it. And then the most recent one, I guess, was a short film. Um, that was purely out of boredom. I had nothing to do because something like that takes a lot of time. And it was a contest on YouTube. I tried to, uh, I tried to get through, I think top five, they got up to $2,000. Okay. And first well. place got 2000. Second place was 1500 and it was 500, 500, 500. So it was a total of $5,000 price pool. Not humongous for like a film thing, but it was just sort of, um, a thing to do during these times right so it, it's a good project to to try literally yeah and so i didn't end up getting in the top five but i ended up going in the top 20 honorable mentions or whatever because there were so many submissions there were 1952 so wow 2000 sub submissions and you're and it's not just canada 20. it's all over the world and these are people who actually do film so it was a little different well the, that's a good sign like how great your work was because yeah i felt you're... honestly so flattered whenever um because the guy who did the contest he posted a youtube video and he had mentioned like oh you know there was this this roman kid from canada <laughs> it was pretty cool that was, alone i was like yes <laughs> <laughs> it was like I've, you, you got like a compliment by people who act, it's actually their job to do that yes so. yeah whenever it's whenever you get a compliment from someone who does this as a living that's when you're like, oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, it's just the, even just the feeling that a piece of work, because I invested so much time into that. I'd say I only had one week to do it. I think I spent like 40, 40, 50, 60 hours, something like wow. insane. But And yeah. as far as video, that's like, it's, it's extremely good, but it's like three minutes. Yeah. Like, it's a three so, minute video. That's exactly. how everything works. That's how anything in film works. You think about it, it's like a two hour movie. That thing has went through like months of yeah. work. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really crazy. <laughs> yeah. And um, is it something outside of skating, example, after your career that could be like your, your career path for you? Or? Yeah, I, I thought about um, stuff in the film industry. And I think one of the problems is very competitive. There's yeah. a lot of talented filmmakers out there. I sort of, um, I thought about doing stuff like maybe even like 
wedding videos, for example, just to start, or just um, real estate videos. So if you're trying to sell a house and stuff like that, that sort of stuff you can do. It is income. It's not humongous, but it's something you can start to do like portfolio work. Um, I thought about maybe going into school for it. The thing with film is it's not, nece- it's not a necessity, put it that way. I, f- I feel that there's a lot of people in the film industry who have like maybe not no education, like post-secondary education, but sometimes they have degrees that are not at all film related. Yeah. Like they're like political science majors and they have nothing about film, but somehow they're working in film because a lot of, a lot of it is who you're connected to. A lot of it is honestly, YouTube is a big thing. If you have a lot of good work on YouTube, people will hire you just based off of that. Cause it's just proof of work. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's a very interesting field cause it's, you don't necessarily need a post-secondary education. So yeah, I, I definitely thought about stuff even as like smaller stuff like wedding videos. And I also thought about maybe even broadcast and stuff like that. If I could find a spot, I don't even know. Maybe we could find a spot in Skate Canada. I, I don't know. It'd be fun, but we'll see. Like you can, like you can show, you can do good, like great videos, but mm. also you have like your, your life with skating, which bring you some contacts and opportunities. So yeah. maybe like one day you could like mix that up. And uh, I, I'd love to, honestly, at can, that point, I'd love to, but it can open some doors maybe. And uh, you never know. It wasn't something that I, I thought about when I first started the channel, but it is something I think about more. So like, even I thought about, okay, I'm exposing myself way more now. I'm getting more of a viewership. It could be in a way, an opportunity for other media stuff, which I, I totally love doing. I love doing like this stuff, this podcast, or I love doing these um, like Zoom calls lately that I've been doing. I've yeah. been doing a lot, like a lot of calls, a lot of big groups, and I like sharing my experiences. So even if I could do some of that, even here and there in the future, I love to. So of course, yeah. and I, I, you're super comfortable with it, and it shows through your videos. So that's, yeah, honestly, that's what, a lot of that helps even just talking to a camera for like two or three years, you get way more comfortable with other people. Surprisingly, you get way more comfortable with other people and just media in general. Of course. And, uh, on a, a more like personal, uh, personal point of view, like, did you feel like you're, uh, you have more fans or do you think you're closer to some people because of that? Did it, did it brought you some like, uh, more like on a personal side, like closer in relationship with people that w- were further with you because it's, it's virtual, but you can have still a, a contact with them. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I know what you mean. I definitely do feel more connected. Um, it's funny because I get, I get mentions about my channel here and there. And sometimes I like disconnect for a second so someone says like oh i love your youtube videos and i think for a second i'm like whoa people actually watch that like it's like <laughs> really really weird so it in in a weird way it's almost two different worlds but at the same time i can see when people like mention it or sometimes i even see signs whenever i'm skating or it's just rome ski i'm like oh they watch my youtube channel so it's, it's like there is something like you do feel like people are behind you yeah so whenever you get the thing with social media is you get positive and negative comments all the time. But every time you get like a positive comment and you see people are like asking for more content or wanting more, you definitely feel um, more connected and you, you want to deliver no matter what. Right. Of course. Um, I try my best to be as transparent in my videos. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to be like a very, like, I am still diplomatic, right. No, no matter what, like I am going to still have like, there's a certain filter you have to meet, but I want it to be as relatable and as normal as it is. I don't want to be like this, like, I don't know, really perfect on camera yeah. person. I want it to be more like, this is me. This is my life. This is how I train. It doesn't have to be like all positive. It doesn't have to be all fun and games. You know, some practices are going to suck. Uh, I, I'm going to say like, that sucked. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, just, that's just me. Right. So I, I do like that. Um, my audience can see the real me as opposed to just something you might see on a TSN interview, for example. Yeah. Right? So it's a little bit different. So I, I try to have that sort of that natural part that people can see. Cause that's what I'd rather people see, you know? And that's what people can relate to also. Cause yeah. uh, if I just take, for example, uh, one thing I like the most is uh, when you won national this year, the intro of your video, you said like, hear what I said last year and you, <laughs> You go back and you say, oh, it's like uh, my last competition and something right. like that. 
and then you say like we did it like you can relate to like bad moments and good moments so right exactly it's, it's not just like all all victories and success like you yeah you, that's you the sh- point right i don't need to be like some kind of perfect human right at the end of the day it's just it's a process and i want yeah. people to see the process i want to see what it's like being a figure skater because at the end of the day when i watch the most part you can see they're not like superhuman like other vloggers that of i've course. seen it's not like they're superhuman right they're just normal people and i think people like to see what people are like normally as opposed to um i guess it's not reality tv because reality tv is still not completely reality there's yeah. a little bit of that disconnect where it's like okay this seems a little bit scripted or this seems a little bit um unreal in a way so i want it to be as real as possible i don't script any of my videos i just put the camera down and talk of course i do cuts here and there i don't always talk perfectly but for the most part i try to keep it as unscripted as possible just so that I get everything in that moment captured, if that makes sense. It's more uh, spontaneous. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's what absolutely. life is. It's not, it's not scripted. You don't have time to I'm, go Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it real. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, we'll go in uh, other uh, segment of the... I'd like to... Uh, in French, we, I call it the uh, question en rafale. I don't know what's in English. I think it's bursting questions. I have no idea if that's the right word. That's Google Translate. So okay, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's uh, quick, it's quick like questions. Quick questions, yeah. Just like okay. uh, first thing that comes uh, in your head uh, <laughs> that you think about. So uh, you answer uh, that the first thing uh, that comes Let's to your mind. Gonna happen. Um, okay. So what do you eat before a competition? Anything carb-based, rice, pasta, something like that, cookies. <laughs> Great. And uh, what do you eat after the competition? Literally anything. I get so hungry after competition. Before competition, not as hungry, but after competition, I eat as much as possible. <laughs> That's great. Um, what's the favorite place you visit with a competition? For a competition? Mm, probably Japan. So in H- NHK this year you went? and uh... NHK was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I've been to Tokyo also in the past. That's pretty cool also. All of Japan yeah. is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also skating there is like crazy. So it is, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, Japan, absolutely. Japan is awesome. Yeah. Um, if you compete uh, late at night, so uh, what will you do in the day for like waiting? Sleep. The whole day? Well, not the whole day. Maybe an hour to uh, walk, go outside a lot. Yeah. Great um okay who's your biggest idol in the uh, figure skating or in life in general jeffrey bottle great uh what's your your best performance from him i think 2008 uh worlds was yeah. it 2008 i think so yeah. the long program yeah it's funny you said that because I just watched that performance this morning. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> like it came on my YouTube. Yeah, and it wasn't even it wasn't even close. He was, it was so far ahead of everyone else. It was yeah. Just like, he he showed what 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 had to be done. Like he showed uh, everything that he could do. Absolutely. Um, if you would not be uh, doing figure skating, what sport would you do? Probably gymnastics. I can I can see you do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what music do you listen to before going uh, on the ice for a competition? Lately, it's been a lot of K pop, so Korean pop. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> and um, finally, what is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. I would say K pop honestly goes into that. <laughs> yeah. I feel there's a lot of people who, who frown upon K-pop, but I love K-pop. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so that's it for the, those questions. Um, cool. I'll go with the uh, last part uh, of the podcast. It's uh, more like a retrospective. Uh, we'll take a step back and l- sure. l- look back uh, in time. Um, first of all, I wanted to know uh, who's a, a person who has like a major impact in your career. So someone that really helped you get where you are today, but not someone that is like a, on the front page, like that we, someone we don't know who helped you a lot, but who is actually super important in your career. Mm. Am I allowed to say my parents or is that well, <laughs> or uh, still front page? Well, 
you can say that, but like we, I mean, I think we assume that they help you. I, I yeah. hope they okay. help you. Okay, so that doesn't <laughs> count, I guess. <laughs> um, hmm. I would say, honestly, a lot of skaters, there's a lot of role models that I looked up to. It's sort of hard to, it's hard to skate in complete isolation, no matter what. If you're not exposed to some kind of um, talent, I want to say, I don't know if that's the right word per se, but if you're not exposed to people, so for example, if you're training and you're the only one on the ice, it's sort of hard to get motivated. But I think we live in an age where with the internet, you can literally motivate yourself so easily. You can yeah. watch your competitors, you can watch like all your role models. So I think growing up, I sort of found, um, I didn't like copying people. That was sort of my big thing. So I didn't want to necessarily copy people. I sort of wanted to find an individual style. Um, a lot of people compare me to Jeffrey Bottle and maybe um, there was a, uh, subconscious sort of rub off in a way so uh, I sort of gone into that style a little bit but it wasn't necessarily intentionally like oh I'm gonna be all Jeffrey at the end of the day I sort of tried to find uh, certain qualities of different people here and there and try to um, get there you know what I mean so yeah let's say I loved Yuzu's triple axel I don't I still I still love that thing right it's so perfect and it's so aggressive and I I sort of wanted to get like, so I thought to myself, I want to get as aggressive into that axle as Yuzu, right? So and I'm, not, I'm not copying Yuzu by any yeah. means. I just, these certain qualities here and there, I tried to grab and, and tried to sort of fuse them into my own skating. So I tried to get that going and that you was get, sort of a big thing. You get like inspired by, by right, your models, so, your competitors. and Right. So I'd say my biggest, my biggest thing, um, people still see yuzu of course but i guess yeah. people don't see the underlying inspirations are basically stuff that you see day to day so if i was like 15 i was just getting back my triple axel or um just landing my quad sal a lot of those inspirations come from different skaters right so yuzu was a yeah. big yuzu a big part was his ag aggressiveness into those jumps i wanted to get that aggressiveness um skaters like I'm trying to think off the top of my head uh, Daisuke, I, I love the way Daisuke could move on the ice. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh, he's like, sometimes he looks so free and so, um, careless. It looks easy, like. Yeah. The, like, it's just like, it's a We know it's not easy, but like, it's, it just course. comes so natural, like. Yeah. So, so I look at that and I'm like, of course I'm not going to copy Daisuke, but at the same time, it's like, I want to get that sort of, that sort of careless. It's not careless. That's it's not the best word to use. Careless in the sense that of course he cares and he cares about his movement, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. so just like with his breath, like it's so natural and so easy. I guess effortless is the best way to explain it. So I wanted to get some of that going. Um, that's sort of all I can think of right now off of the top of my head. But I think just people I was surrounded with were a big part. And thank God that we have internet and we can see this stuff. And of you course. can watch over, over, and over you can see all these jumps you want to see you can see all these movements these spins you can see anything you want to see stefan lambiel spins i loved his spins yeah it's they inspired. are crazy like it's they are very very good so, so fast and so like centered also i mean that's a detail course. we often i mean i think that's not the first detail you notice but like yeah he stays in the same spot for like 30 seconds that's crazy yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that that was like I find these sort of things because every skater has a good quality, right? Not, no one's particularly like completely perfect, yeah. right? Some, I think Patrick, Patrick's a perfect example. Also my favorite performance of his, I remember his four continents, 2018, was it? No, uh, 2018 was the Olympic. year, the year before 17. maybe. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. That long program. It was uh, Chopin so so good and i remember watching that and i'm like holy like i want to get that that like edge quality that sort of ease in his skating that was like that was by far my my top program from patrick but same thing like patrick another skater and it's not like i'm going to copy them right so i sort of just found okay you're exposed to all this and you can take qualities here and there and try to sort of it's almost ingredients to a recipe yeah, and you bring them together. Patrick, one time he he compared improving skating as if 
um, you're building a race car because he's super into cars from what I know. Yeah. And so he compared that you're tweaking stuff here and there. You're changing maybe the tires a little bit, um, tuning the engine a little bit. These all these little things that add up to a, a race car, right? And every race car is going to be a little bit different. And that's sort of what I'm, I'm sort of doing here is I'm gaining these ingredients. And that was sort of that underlying thing that people don't see necessarily. Obviously, some people say, oh, you skate like Jeffrey Bottle. Okay, so I guess that one showed a little bit. But they <laughs> sort of get those ingredients. And they toss, I try to toss them in and sort of create something that's my own. So I'd say the biggest thing that's underlying is all a lot of skaters, a lot of skaters that I've seen and stuff that I try to bring together. Oh, that's great. And that's, that's also like inspiring for like, you can see so much and learn so much just by looking at stuff on YouTube or on the, yeah. the internet. Like, and what, that, it's a great, great time to be alive. I'm telling you, this internet stuff's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, I want to know if you have like a funny or special uh, embarrassing, um, embarrassing moment, uh, uh, an funny anecdote ice. or on the competition or uh, something that happened to you that's quite funny or unique that doesn't happen every day. Like just an anecdote <sighs> like that. Huh. Okay, well, I wouldn't say this is funny. I was a little bit stressed when this happened, but it's something you laugh about later. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was tying my skates. This was a Junior Grand Prix in Poland in 2016. I'm going to say 16. I'm going to stick by it. I don't know if it was 16, but I'm going to say <laughs> it. Dresden. I think 2016. Yeah, I think it was 2016. No. Oh my God, my memory is failing me. 2013 14 was my first year. 14 15, 16 17. I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I had a Junior Grand Prix in Poland. Okay. <laughs> and so I was tying my skates to my long program. And I think every skater more or less does this. They pull on their tongue of the boot a little bit so that it just goes yeah. a little bit higher and doesn't squish the toes. I didn't put much effort into it, but I pulled it up and then came right out. It, it ripped. It ripped right out and so easily and made this like ripping noise. And I remember, um, do you know uh, Sota Yamamoto? uh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. okay he competes uh he was competing with you in junior at that time yes and he yeah. still competes senior yeah so i actually competed with him last year it's pretty cool seeing him again but anyway i remember clearly when i pulled it out he looked over his jaw was on the floor <laughs> he was just like oh and i'm just imagine me i'm looking at my boot without a tongue i have a tongue in my hand like, <laughs> holy cow and that was right before your program Yeah, right before, um, what was it, six-minute warm-up. Oh, my God. And how, how did you uh, deal with that? You could not, like, get a new skate. I, I, I put it back in and tied it up. <laughs> oh, wow. It, it felt different. It definitely felt different. But I'm like, I got nothing to lose. Yeah. And this yeah. Was the, What? the problem with this event is this event, I had to do, I had to medal in this event to go to the final. Because I, I won the first Junior Grand Prix of the season. I had to medal in this one. And I was second or third i think second after the short i feel i was second after the short i was thinking damn it like i just got a medal just go and so i just put tongue back in tied it up and you managed to do it i i managed not to skate perfect i think i did everything except for the first quad sal which i almost did i actually really thought i was going to do the quad sal i just sat down at the end but i did the rest and i did it and i remember taking off my skates like And the kiss and cry. I don't know if you can see it actually, but I took him off and I was like, wow. Like I, I, wanted, I, I, I almost wanted to like bring them up and show them on camera. I'm like, ah, that's too much. It's like, okay, that's <laughs> well, still, yeah. that's, that's crazy that you managed to like, it's, it's something you don't, and, yeah, yeah. That's, that's and, nothing I experienced before. Like, I've, of course, you know what? No, I've pulled out a tongue before, but I've never skated with it pulled out. If so I pulled it out, prepare, like, uh, yeah, I would have been like, ah, I'll just get a new boot. Because getting boots is pretty easy these days. You're like, ah, yeah. okay, switch boots. But this time I was just like, I'm no, I have no boots. I got it. I got to be in third place if I want to go to this final. Wow. Put the tongue back in, go. Hopefully it holds. <laughs> it didn't hold perfectly, but I did what I could. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Um, and finally, uh, my final question would be, um, 
if you could tell something uh, to yourself uh, five years ago, like a, a, a how do you say that? I can't say. Uh, uh, I lost my word in English. Do you like, mean? Do you mean to say that? Like, what would I say to myself five years ago as like advice? Yeah, advice. That's the word. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. like, advice or a, a thought or anything like. <sighs> I would say patience. I think my time, my past few years growing and trying to develop patience was probably, no, sorry, impatience was probably my biggest problem. I wanted to throw in a lot in a program really quick because I was so used to competing against skaters that were doing triple axles, quads, and I was competing with them doing none of that. So for example, I was doing junior Grand Prix, I was meddling, I was getting like third, I was getting these events without doing these triple axles and quads, right? So I'm, I'm looking at everyone, I'm, I think there's like a top 10, probably eight out of 10 are doing these high-end jumps and I'm the only one who's, who's getting up there with just skating skills and quality and spins. And yeah. sure, that's, that's all fantastic, but to me that was just like, I don't know, I didn't like being labeled as like, ah, oh, he doesn't have the jumps, but he's a beautiful skater. Of course, being a beautiful skater is awesome, but I wanted to be beautiful skater and, and the jumps, right? Also, so yeah. I was really, I was spending a lot of practices trying to throw in these jumps in a, in a program that weren't completely possible for me. So even when I'm coaching now, now that I'm coaching, I know that like when I'm watching skaters, Sometimes they're impatient. They want to throw stuff in. But now I learned myself. Like, that's not possible. And thankfully, Tracy also, she held me back. If we're, if we're just up to me, I'd be throwing in so much stuff in the program that yeah. I would not be able to do. So thank God that there's Tracy there to, like, control me and keep me at bay and say, this is realistic and try to get within these, I guess, Absolutely. boundaries. Right? Just get, 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 yeah. get into that. Do what's realistic and then you still have to milk whatever you can do. So if you're still a beautiful skater, don't ever get rid of that, right? Yeah. And, she, and she always knew that I sort of felt like I wasn't delivering enough technically. And that was my biggest downside. I'm like, oh, I want to get these quads. I want to get these quads. Even to this day, I'm still a little bit like that. I want to do like three quads in the program. And like last season, I wanted to do that quad toe in the program, but it just wasn't quite, I wasn't getting the consistency I wanted. Of course. And it, it worked, right? At the end, I did, okay, so I did two triple axles, two quads. Maybe it's not four, like Nathan or Yuzu, but I'm still getting up there, and there's still a lot you can do with those two axles and two quads. Absolutely. Right? So I'm still obviously going to, no matter what, I'm still going to be tr practicing uh, toe loop and maybe some other quads. But, yeah, no. It, the best thing I would say to myself in the past, you got to be patient, work on what you have, they will come. Stuff will come no matter what, but you got to be patient to get it's there. It's taking each step and not like skipping a step. Yeah. There's no, there's no easy way. Absolutely. There's nothing to do. This sport is so hard. <laughs> yeah. Impossible. Absolutely. And if, if you would say something to yourself uh, in five years, uh, five years from now, what, what, what would it be? Like uh, in the future? Yeah. In the future. If you could say something to yourself in the future, what would it be? Oh, that's a different one. There's so much mystery in the future. Um, you know, you know what? I'd probably remind myself, like, you're capable of stuff. Because you're not sure what's going to happen in the future, but there's always tough times. And I always think to myself, oh, I haven't had a bad day on the ice for a while. And then they happen to happen. Yeah. And it's just like, ah. Uh, and they're, they're inevitable, right? So I think if I tell myself in the future, I'd be like, just remember, like, I could list, oh, you've won Canadians before, you know, you've, you've had a lot of international success before. I think I just remind myself, like, you've got this, like, you have stuff behind you and you can trust it. You know, there's a lot of training behind you, a lot of work done behind you. Because in the future, who knows, maybe it's going to be really good and then maybe it's also going to be a struggle. You never really know what's going to happen. And I think I just reinforced that. So if I'm doing good in five years, and if I tell myself, oh, you were a Canadian champion before, that's not bad, right? Yeah, of course so I tell them, you were a Canadian champion. And then five, Absolutely. five 20, 25 year old Roman would be like, you're right. That's good. Also, yeah. if I'm not doing very well when I'm 25, I'd be like, you know what? You're right. That's good. I can do it again or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. 
yeah. well that that's a great way of thinking i think and yeah that's also it's good that you can appreciate what you do what you did like yeah. it's you uh, you always want more accomplishment and more success but to l be able to look back and say like hey i did that and like be proud of that i think that's yeah. great even yeah. though you still want more and that's totally normal because yeah. that's the point of doing competition right so 100 i used to think i remember thinking about when tess and scott came back or when um patrick continued to skate or even to a degree you zoom thinking or even lots of people are thinking like what are they still doing you've won everything i think yuzu has won i think every event there is to win yeah i think he has I, I straight think up like, won they call it the the, the slam Grand or something slam. like yeah Grand exactly slam. yeah he, he won every championship series he won the final he won every grand Prix. i think he, he may have won every grand prix possible I'm, so, i would not be surprised <laughs> and then i'm thinking to myself like or even others when i see comments on youtube like oh, what are they doing and you know what i think i see it now like Like we all love to skate. It's yeah. not necessarily about accomplishments, and of course, accomplishments are awesome. But like, <laughs> of course, there's there's this underlying that people love to skate, people love to compete, and they love that feeling. Sometimes you're on the ice, you're competing, you feel so terrible, you feel so nervous, and you ask yourself like, "Oh my God, why do I do this?" But you actually kind of love it. Yeah, you just absolutely you love being in a situation where your heart's like racing, or where you feel like you're gonna puke. Or you feel like you're like shaking, right? The you adrenaline, these nerves that at all oh, the adrenaline, yeah. and you think to yourself, "Why are you doing it?" But you're doing it because you, you low key love that. In the end of the day, so I understand that. Well, that's great, and I think uh, there's a great thing ahead of you, and I hope. Uh, Thank you. I really hope uh, you can go back. Everyone can go back on the ice as soon as possible, so we can see oh, more yeah. of what's coming. And I think the next season, if there's one. It will be quite exciting I, because of that. It's so weird. Yeah, people exactly. Thinking, I, I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting in what order people open up because people are opening up at, at different times. Yeah. I think people in Germany are starting to skate. Um, some countries in Europe are starting to skate. I'm unaware if Japan fully closed or not. I'm unsure. I feel like there might be some skating going on. But even I haven't just, heard anything. Just in Canada here, like some province will start and some others won't like exactly just in in one country there will be some difference by exactly. every region that's crazy so people might have like a full month head start and you're like oh i just started and so actually i had, I had a meeting with skate canada and they were saying because we usually have our high performance camp i don't i don't know september august somewhere yeah. somewhere there and they said yeah we're going to change it a little bit which makes sense can you imagine everyone goes back in august and we're going to try to do a simulation for judges like how's that going to work that, that would not make sense <laughs> yeah no <laughs> well thank you roman i think it, it was a, a great pleasure for me to thank to you talk with you today and it was also very interesting and that was I'm, fun i'm very glad uh, you understood my english so for me that's a big accomplishment nah, dude, dude, listen your english is good and <laughs> thank you know you. what we've, we've, we've traveled together before so yeah I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Well, thank you so much and uh, stay no safe problem. and take care of yourself. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>